All right. Ready to go? Okay, I want to talk about two things on the networking side really quick. So the first one, this, 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 this is the first one. Um, I, I recently hit this problem. Yeah. Oh, but, then, but then I can't point at my picture. Uh, um, I, I'll, I'll, I might do like this, I think. Um, all right, so I, I, I was going to do a quick stock map update on some of the stuff we're working on stock map, but before I do that, I wanted to hijack this slightly to talk about a, a, another problem that we recently had. Um, so if we look at like how you're going to grab packets off the device so at the lowest level, mm -hmm. level and you want to have like a per packet view. So typically we do this with TC filter right now. We add a, attach a QDisk and then we attach a BPF filter to the QDisk, right? And this works if you're able to attach the TC filter to the QDisk. And the problem that we've recently hit is, is sort of twofold. One is you have to know when the when the interfaces are being created so that you can attach a filter to it, right? So you have to go through the step where you get notified that a new device was created. Then you have to attach your, your, your filter, which may be some ACL policies or maybe some observability piece. And then you have to tell whatever the thing is that's out there that it can now continue to bring up the whatever's using the interface, like a pod or in Kubernetes speak or container or in um, sort of other languages. So this is sort of problematic because now you're, you're trying to trying to interleave yourself into this control flow, and you need to make sure you get that correct. Because if you get that incorrect, you basically have a gap where you don't see any traffic that that container was being, going to send. Um, so that's, that's the first problem. Um, and then the second problem is in, in a Kubernetes space, if you look over here, we have two pods in my, my sort of stick diagram here. Um, and those pods actually can have other devices in them that we're not even told about from Kubernetes. So like, if a application creates another loopback device, um, we don't have a filter on it, so we, see, we, don't, we just are blind to that um, traffic. Or in the SR IOV case, um, which we've actually seen a few use cases of in production, where they actually have other devices outside of Kubernetes that they pull into the pod for high performance stuff, low latency type things. Um, but we don't have any visibility there either because there's no, um, there's no signal from the control plane that this happened. Or at least that control plane is a different control plane, and now we have to go instrument that secondary control plane to tell us, aha, this was added. And now we're back to this whole flow problem, control flow problem, where we need to make sure they don't send traffic um, until after we've attached. And even worse, we're, we're actually, Cilium, for example, is running in the host, and so somehow it has to reach into the container and say, attach my filter, and then somehow tell that container not to detach it, um, which you know is, is sort of not plausible. So, there's, there's some, some workarounds with this um, to, to kind of defeat this is you can use like a K probe that just attaches to devqxmit <laughs> and the receive side. And you will see every packet regardless of when this is created. Right? Like it doesn't matter, you don't need a signal. You'll get, a, you'll get your K probe hook called, you'll have a pointer to the device so you know what device it is. And then, um, uh, and then you can do whatever you need filter wise or, or, or whatever. Um, so, the only problem with the K-probe is because it's a K-probe, you don't know that it's an, you, you're sort of in this K-probe space and you don't have all your normal SKB helpers. Um, so I, I thought about this and there's, there's kind of two ways that I was proposed fixing it. Um, one is to put like a, just a dedicated hook there that's right where we have the egress hook now, but abstract it away from the device so that you don't have to attach. You attach maybe at the C group level, like a C group program. And then, um, which you could attach to the root C group, and then it would be called on every packet. And you would just get a device pointer and the SKB, which is all, well, you don't even need the device pointer because the device pointer is embedded in the SKB at that point. So you just need the SKB. And then you could run all your SKB helpers over the top of it. But you also would always be guaranteed that your program is run and wouldn't need to worry about this ordering problem. Like C, C group egress, I thought it's not device specific. It's like scope by C group. That's it. And you yeah, it's at the IP layer, right? Yeah. Yeah, I want to go lower, one lower to the L2 layer. Wait, but uh, I thought you only want this to like find out which device was created. You could like kprop meddev create oh, and no, no, no. Uh, know the device and then, and then attach to it. So I want a... Or like Netlink Notifier. I thought Netlink has all, the, all of the noti right, notification but, but mechanism for NetDevs coming and going. 
it has the notifier, but they're racy. Like you get the event, but it yes. might have already been created. Um, so, but, but really, I think the, maybe I didn't get the point across is what we want is to see every packet coming out of like LO inside the pod or, or ETH0 if they spun up an ETH inside the pod. And we want to see it like a packet hook. So we see every L2 packet coming out of the device. So you want C group scoped hook, but done at layer Yeah, just two. one layer lower. So we have IP layer now, right? And we have all the TCP C group hooks for mm -hmm. everything in the TCP stack. Um, and we use the IP, you have all your, for UDP and everything else, but we want it down at the packet level, actually, so we know so what device it's The going main out. problem with the C group scoping at layer two, that <clears throat> there is no C group, right? There is no SKB, right? <laughs> right. Or if there is a SKB, it could be like, Kernel just doing yeah, like exactly. MP, MTU probing. It's yep. not C group specific. But I, but I, I actually don't care about the C group scoping, because even if I had a hook that ran on every packet that went through Dev QX Mint, which is like the last call before the OS before the driver, right? Um, that would be enough. So I don't actually, I don't actually have a use case for the scoping. It would just be like a, it would be where the TC hook is, but without the TC context. Like I don't, I don't care about the QDisc. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to implement a queuing discipline. I'm just trying to implement a filter or an observability point. And I think you also, wa you also want to have the case where the application in the pod itself cannot just remove it, right? Exactly. So the, I, I don't even want the pod to see it, really. Mm -hmm. Ideally, the pod has no way to even know if it's hooked or not hooked, right? Like, it just does its normal thing. And this becomes even more problematic with like SROV, where they, they bind an SROV device in there. So now they have access to the network, but Cilium has no way to, to do filtering, right? It's outside Cilium's scope. Unless you get into this, now, now you have this problem. It's like, well, you could, in theory, hook into the SROV control plane and figure out that it's added and add your program somehow inside. You could do like an NS enter and add it, but then they could delete it, right? This is, this is really ugly too, right? So I think you should just get away from this trying to race with the control flow and just say, Here's my hook. I want to run on every packet that leaves my system. Will uh, like <coughs> uh, uh, having a sleepable hook inside NetDev create work? It, it would. You mean in the sense that then that, that hook would be able to attach things to it, like a f filter to it, or like a QDisk? Like, but, but, yeah. But then it would have to attach the filter and not ex not allow that filter to be deleted. Yes. By the container. Yes. Because that's separate. Like to yeah. me, it feels like orthogonal. Not being able to like delete it or see it. That's we can solve it separately. Whereas like hook that's not gated by anything doable as well. It just feels that it will be a harder sell. Um, yeah. So two things. I, I think if that BPF program could then say like here's here's my program either in like a prog map or something, and then here's the dev from the BPF helper, just to call it and attach it, that would probably mm -hmm. be sufficient. Right, you don't even need to call out to user space, you could just do like, yeah, a, yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, just yeah, a BPF exactly. helper yeah. attach, yeah. that would probably work. Well, one other question there, so you said before like you don't care about the C group, but you probably do want to know which C group the device is inside so that you can maybe do some like different policy or different sort of logic yeah, for each. Yeah, I assume that the this would have so you'd have something like a, like a C group ID or something that I could grab and, and okay. associate okay. that with some policy, right? But that still need to go back to the socket. You cannot go back to the socket. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for eQuest, it would probably work. Like, you can go to, from SKB to the socket and then to the oh, Z group. But, uh, two, two things, right? So, like, the one is, like, the create hook, mm -hmm. like, I think what, which we're talking about here. And the other is the actual data path side. And on the actual data path, I just, on eGress, you have the SKB, which has the dev. The dev has a net namespace. I can probe all that if I want to, right? I probably would cache it, but like, you could do SKB to dev, dev to namespace. Now you have the network namespace. Now you're off and running, right? Like you should have a map somewhere that says network namespace belongs to this policy group. On receive, it's slightly tricky, but you still have the dev. The dev has a namespace. You have a network namespace. In sort of Kubernetes world, a, a, a pod is sort of, an, a set of namespaces, one of them being the network namespace. Mm -hmm. It gets a bit tricky with containers, right, because containers yeah. can have different network namespaces, but that's pretty, pretty. Uh, but then you want per NetNS and not per C group, right? So, so I, 
from my side, I'm, I'm not so interested in the per seat group piece. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm interested in is ensuring that that pod there has no way to delete my hook and has no way to sort of get running before my hook's in place. Which is, you know, it, whether that's a generic hook all the way across that runs on everything and doesn't have any context, or it's a somehow we hook create and have a BPF helper load it. I, I'm not sure I care too much. So like not the, then going back to you, like yeah. not deleting parts. So we've talked forever about uh, BPF <laughs> link for TC. Yeah. One of the reasons is exactly not being able to run them up to delete it. Sorry, so say that again. I think so. I may have missed the comment. Like BPF link for TC, well, yes. if you have holding that FD for an attachment, no one will delete it. And could we do a link from BPF code? Build the link and put the file descriptor in a map, and then the map is in the host context, so it can never be well, removed? Well, some of it, of course, like currently yeah. there is no BPF link for TC. I think last was Kumar who was had patches to do it, and that never landed. But uh, that's so same stuff, right? Maybe more fundamentally. So it's, it's the same like why we yeah. have BPF link for XDP. But if I take a like a half step back, it's like why do I want to be in the TC infrastructure at all? Because I'm not doing a QDisc. I'm just trying to like like the K probe hook that I have now is like almost all I need. It just doesn't have a few of the helpers that would be would be nice to have. So so that TC hook was without TC. You you wouldn't need like QDisc there. Like the way we would trying to like talk it through like with Kumar and Daniel yeah. is that it's TC, but there is no TC, no need to create even knob QGs, what are we called, ingress and egress QGs, none, none of that yeah, business it's because it's like, it's just a hook. Yeah, so but the yeah. idea was to have like from an API point of view, it looks like TC, but it doesn't create any QGs business. Right. There's no IP route involved in any of this. It's just at this layer where currently all the hooks right. are, but without creating all of the right. QG stuff with a guarantee that uh, attachment is preserved by BPF link. And then we could, could we take where that egress hook is right now and we could just sort of say there's a BPF hook here, here's its link, and then we attach it with this BPF helper. So link is an attachment itself. Yeah. Like you have a program, you attach it there, you get an FD, and well, it stays attached. Currently we cannot persist links anywhere but BPFFS. I, th I think that would be sufficient plus the hook at create time, if we, which we yeah. could probably just do with a K probe, right? If we, if we had this help, this syscall, or sorry, if we had this, um, this helper exposed in sleepable context, I could like just- some of this like secure, I think like there might be even like LSM hooks somewhere for the net link, maybe not for net dev. Like if not, potentially that should be there. Like net dev, net dev creation. LSM worse, yeah, I would say. <laughs> yeah, or we could just put a K probe there with a the helper, right? Probably don't need to even sleep to attach a program, right? Oh, yeah, to, to get the link. If the program's already created, already loaded, do you need to sleep to link it? Potentially not, but like <clears throat> we're talking about changing the kernel, so like for backward stuff, you would still struggle through whatever key probe and jump to user space, whatever other. But uh, in upstream, yeah, why not to the proper yeah. sleepable hook that is clean and can do all sorts of other stuff. Yeah. And I think like from the from the TC data path side, I would love to have like a dedicated TC ingress and egress hook where we don't need to go to the QDisks. So it's just annoying overhead that is not necessary. Right, I mean, like, like for this particular use case, right, we use K-probe hooks, and like I said, it's clumsy and it's a little bit racy, right? So we want to get rid of that piece, and, the, and it works great. So like, there's no reason to try to get hooked into a queuing discipline, right? It's like, I mean, like, for, like from a, for, like, where I want to get to from a Cilium perspective at least is where you don't need to have too many changes. You can just take the existing programs as is and just attach them to this new API yeah. for the BPF system call that is still DC, but uh, like the, the underlying code doesn't care whether it's right. there for old kernel or new kernel, it will just work. That would, that would be good and more flexible. 
and we don't need to go through all of this. I don't know, like the the, the TC side has a lot of offloading stuff that is being added, like the SKB extensions and blah blah blah, and this is just annoying. It's it, it keeps growing, and this way we can make it even more efficient. So, so I think the the takeaway then would be to look at a create net dev hook with a helper to attach a link to uh, to a hook in the egress and the ingress path. Mm -hmm. So I would say to revive the Kumar's patches, I think they were pretty close. The, the kernel side, I think, was non-controversial. It was more on the like libpf side, which API would be, and there were like some comments. But I think it was, like, if I recall, Andre, if you remember, like I think it was pretty close. I think you guys would decide but Yeah. I've, I mean, I would love to, like from, from a dependency perspective, I would love to have like this new uh, lightweight TC thing first where you have work based on file descriptor and then it's just a natural fit for the link, right? And then we don't need, even need to deal with the legacy crap, so. Yeah. yeah. And then we you don't have to support all the, the, the TC stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, that, I think that I remember that was some of the problem too. Can, is like, what about all the other yeah. things that TC does? Like, we don't we, care about those. We things. can stop caring about it at that point. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. So I, I would say the goal, if I understood you correctly, is to, to allow this what they call CLS SCAD Act programs. So only those. No need for yeah. other. No, other no, other no other like nothing else. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. yeah. should be easy. And also, libpf can naturally use it. It will just probe the underlying kernel and it will then use the new one or fall back to the old one. That's also easy. You don't need... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we should just do it. I think we've been talking about it for some time, but... Yeah, like we have uh, urgent need for it now. <laughs> I do. Anyways. That's good. <laughs> cool. Um, then... That makes sense. And then the next one would be, can I add um, probe, probe read and to, to the CLS ACT programs? We already have that. Do no. we have it there now? Is it there? You, I think you added Did this. I add it already? OK, good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Just use it. What's that? For, For the, the task. task. Get current task and then probe read and probe. Probe we need I think it. Probe it's not there. there. We should add it just so we have it. I think it's also there. Okay. All right. And if you have the SKB, we should add the dev pointer in there so we don't so we can get the dev pointer out. That would be the next thing. Because once you have the dev pointer, you're, you're off and running. Like that's yeah. that's the main hook to everything else. Okay. Cool. I'm happy. <laughs> that's good. Anybody? Anybody else? All right. I'll, I'll talk about stock map for a second too. Uh, do, 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 do. Where's our? Oh, okay, cool. All right. So, if you don't know what sock map is, this is the the blog post on my surveillance. So, <laughs> I told you I didn't do slides. Um, so, if if you, basically how our system works is it does a three way handshake. Three way handshake happens. We have a hook in the C group to say, okay. We're in the three, uh, it's been established. At the established hook, we then add it to this sock map, which is a map um, in the kernel. And when that happens, the SK um, is sort of extended with all this context for running a, a parser on the send message and the receive message side. Um, and so uh, I'll just go over kind of quickly. There's, there's a couple bugs that we're fixing now um, that we see like over long running tests, so we'll, we'll just fix those. And then um, the sort of bigger changes that we wanted to make on this side um, would be to get rid of this sock map and just have a way to say, add, add the PSOC context to this SK. And the main reason is because now we have to sort of right size that sock map. And so in our original use cases, what we were using this for is like a load balancing. So when you load balance, and I kind of come from the switch world, and where I was thinking about a load balancing, like how you would do a switch, uh, which means you just build a huge table and then you populate all the entries in the table and then you run some kind of hashing algorithm over that. Um, and that, that's kind of how hand waving a lot, that's kind of how switches work. Um, and so that was kind of the same idea here is you built a, the sock map table of some 
power of whatever that fits, and then you do a load balancing function over the top of them, and you'll load balance into the network through these sockets. Um, so that was great for load balancing. Um, but the problem is if you want every socket in the system to run through this, or every socket of some criteria to run through this problem, now you have to know how many sockets are going to be in the, in the kernel. And so um, what we were looking at doing is adding um, different hooks so that we can um, basically get rid of that map altogether. And you just say, SK add. Whenever you have a socket context, you should be able to add this, con this um, additional context to it. And say, you know, now, now please run these BPF programs on any send and receive. And in theory, there's no reason even to limit it to just um, established. It's just that's our use case. In theory, that we could like generalize that to other things. I probably won't do that unless I find some reason to. But um, um, so that would be kind of the next change. And then if you've looked at this APIs at all, we have this problem where the transmit side and the receive side are um, not symmetric. So on the transmit side, you worry about SK message, which is like this own scatter gather list. And on the receive side, we still deal with SKBs. Um, the problem with that is that it just means you have a TX program and an RX program. It's not very friendly. Um, the reasons for that are sort of historical. Um, it originally used the stream parser, which was like this other bit of code for KCM. Um, but now we've gotten rid of that. So the next stage is to get rid of the SKB side and just use the directly work on the scatter gather list directly um, in here. Um, so that I think we'll probably start working on that here pretty quick. Um, if anybody cares and they're using this stuff, you know, I guess the main things are we want to get rid of the sock map so we don't have to try to fix that size and then make these two symmetrical. And then the other third thing that comes out of once you've done all this is you can just send on any socket that exists in the system. You don't need to even have it in a map because the send context doesn't use any additional metadata, just does the normal send. Um, so you should be able to take any socket and just send over it from inside the kernel. Um, from the socket layer, we don't care. Um, in theory, unless I figure out some reason there's a race there, but I don't think there is. Um, and then I would say the, the last piece that we've been hitting a lot of this, but I, but I think we got a solution for it um, over lunch, was we've been hitting the tail call recursion limit in some of our programs that run here, because they're doing all like parsing. Um, and so I think what we'll do, if we have the uint, um, the pointers, and then with the sort of iterative loop stuff, we should be able to, I think, use move over the stuff that we have or tail calls over to that and should resolve it. So I'll be, I'll be hacking on that and seeing what happens. Um, so uh, first problem of like getting rid of sock map, that's, uh -oh. that sounded like you want another notifier in the socket create, not only at net dev create, and then you will attach whatever sock map, the old sock map style parsers to send and receive there at the socket create time. Yeah, we already have a sock create. We already hook. have a LSM hook in there, it's yeah. just like only enabling attaching another yeah. BPF program of this sock map type. Well, first take these two types out of sock map, abstract them as not related to sock, sock map, just keep them loaded somewhere and mm -hmm. then take them and socket create time and attach to that socket, right? That put, mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds like what you want, no? Yeah, yeah exactly. I think as a first step, we would probably just do it inside the current hooks that we have, like the established hook, just as a first step, right? Because that's where we already have all the APIs for this. And then at that point, moving it to sock create should be just moving from one sock ops call to a different sock ops call. Sure. Can you actually use it from a, you might actually from a listen, like from a non-established socket? Um, I don't know if it works. <laughs> we need, it's like, it's not tested, but it, it but it was, it's allowed for, um, so I should say, it's tested in the CI. I have not actually used it on any scale, so I don't know how well it works, to be honest. Because they added, it was added for the, um, UDP stuff. Okay. But, but it's we, always a full socket, right? The UDP stuff, maybe TCP not, but yeah, details. But. I yeah, I suspect that there it's probably not working out, like correctly. So like, th there's another question about like what you should do when a socket accepts. So if you attach a program to listen, and then it accepts, what should you do? Should you should you transfer the program that's on the listen down to the new socket, 
or should you have that new socket without any program? So right now, it'll, it'll, when it does that accept and does the clone sock FD, I believe, or something like this, um, it doesn't propagate the programs down. And so there's this gap where like, mm -hmm. you went from listen, to now it has no program. In theory, it could have done a fast, um, fast open and sent some data that was before the secondary hook got added. Yeah. So it's racy. Yeah, racy. Yeah. So like we, yeah. we almost would like it to do like on listen to propagate that socket down, okay. and then you wouldn't have that race because you could run it on the fast open program. But that, that fast open hook doesn't exist, right? Because there's no way to, um, uh, right now, that's not the same hook. Like that's not a send message. That's actually kind of a second, secondary flow of data that you need to somehow actually mm -hmm. hook directly. And, and sort of, you need, need that code in that path, and we don't have anything there. Right now, we just audit it and go, OK, there was a, there was a fast open, and we missed some data. Like we know we missed it because we saw the fast open happen, right? Mm -hmm. Or we just block the fast open. If you try to do a fast open, we just Six, you know, return a pair. Yeah. When you say, uh, hello, when you say get rid of the socket, the map, it should still work on the UDP and other sockets, right? Sorry, sorry, say that again. So when you say you plan to get rid of the map. Yes. And it should still work on the for the UDP and other sockets, right? Hopefully, yeah. I mean, that's that'd be the plan. Get rid of the map. Mm -hmm. I mean, still allow users to have the map because the map mm -hmm. is still useful as a like fundamental concept for like load balancing, right? Okay. Like you look at the. Um, I think Cloudflare was using it this way as like oh, a load okay. balancer on receive, right? Okay. Um, but allow this other use case where you don't want to create the map, okay. well, it's and still then allowed. Okay. and then like sock. Ideally, at sock create when the sock is mm -hmm. created, you mm -hmm. would then give assign a program at that point because mm -hmm. the, really all we need is the 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 additional metadata to be allocated so that when the send message happens, we have this buffer of space to deal with and all the metadata of kind of where we parsed it and there's a BP and we know what BPF program to run right. and so on. Okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Cool. Any other questions, feedback, or? All right. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. Thanks.